Um, hi, uh, dear all, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to our three speakers, uh, Ilaria Conti, uh, Yong Young, and uh, Mari Spirito. Um, so I am Aska, I am a project director at Thanks for Nothing. Um, Thanks for Nothing is a nonprofit organization that was founded in uh, 2017. Um, we bring together artists, art world professionals and NPOs in order to develop artistic and uh, solidarity driven projects with uh, an impact on society. Um, we believe in the power of artists to deepen the understanding we have of uh, current social issues and we want to amplify the voices through creating bridges with as many people as we can but also by uh, developing projects with organization that works in the fields of like human rights, access to education or ecology, or organization that develop new types of research using new kinds of protocols um, and working with people from different uh, kinds of fields. Um, part of our activity also consists in highlighting initiatives that we believe are socially committed. Um, so that social commitment could be uh, because they're more inclusive or because they create bridges between the art world and many other fields or because they question the perspectives we use when looking at culture and arts. Um, so it's in this frame that we've been commissioned by Asia Now, uh, which is an Asian contemporary art fair uh, that is taking place in Paris um, every year during FIAC week uh, since 2014. Uh, Asia Now commissioned us to curate a series of panels that are dealing with the theme of art and social commitment. Um, so in that frame, we invited speakers that wish to raise awareness among the general public on themes and current events that affect our societies uh, in order to give also the keys to new forms of social commitment. But that invitation was also about uh, deepening the understanding of the cultures of different uh, regions in Asia. Uh, to question the historical and geographical approaches, uh, putting forward the curatorial practices and the social commitments of actors of the art world. Uh, so just to present the general program that we curated in this uh, frame of this Asia Now and Thanks for Nothing platform. Um, so there are three other panels, um, plus the one that we, I am currently introducing. Uh, the first one is about, is about art and ecology. Uh, it's about uh, nature uh, in the frame of uh, two different kinds of approach um, and two kinds of approach that are uh, dealt with in two exhibition. One is about a concept, a Chinese uh, Taoist concept of nature called Shun. And the other one is based on the Anating book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins. And so this is the first panel that we, we have curated. Um, the second one is about uh, Iranian female artists uh, who use video to talk about um, their condition, but also to talk about the country and their perception of, uh, how, of life, obviously. Um, the third one, the third panel is about the crisis in Afghanistan. We have decided to invite uh, several artists. Uh, two of them can't, uh, we can't say the, the names of two of them yet because, uh, because of uh, security uh, issues, obviously. Um, but this uh, panel about Afghanistan is uh, uh, the, an, an opportunity to also invite people um, from like the French art world professionals who uh, helped uh, Af Afghan artists to flee their country and uh, to be invited by um, like museums or uh, NPOs in France. Uh, and it will also be the opportunity to talk about uh, young, uh, this young generation of artists, uh, especially as we have invited a curator who worked on a project called Car Carmora in uh, the museum of Musem in Marseille and who was about the, this young, a generation of artists after 2001. So the panel today, uh, the panel that I'm introducing today um, is about, so deepening this understanding that we have about uh, Asia, as I was saying, um, but also about the, the multiple strategies and definitions of social practices uh, in relation to artistic uh, research uh, that have been developed in Asia. 
Um, so, of course, for this topic, we immediately thought of uh, Ilaria Conti. Uh, Ilaria is an independent curator who, among uh, many, many, many projects, um, was uh, the curator, was a, a research uh, curator at the Centre Pompidou. Uh, and she also served as the associate curator on the Cosmopolis platform um, at the Centre Pompidou as well, that she will also uh, tell us a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, so we have, we invited Ilaria to help us curate this panel. Um, Ilaria immediately thought of inviting two curators who will uh, tell, uh, tell us about their social commitment in their practice and uh, the innovative um, initiatives that they developed, uh, that develop in the, those um, research-based curatorial practices and how they work uh, with artists and with um, the general public as well. Um, so Mari Spirito is the uh, executive director and curator of uh, Proto Cinema. And uh, she's based in Istanbul, in Turkey. Uh, and Young Young is an independent writer and curator. She's the founder of a nonprofit organization called Sound Pocket as well uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I will let uh, Ilaria take it on, um, and uh, I thank her again uh, for helping us curating this, this panel, and I thank also uh, Young Young and Mary Spirito to make themselves available uh, in such short notice uh, and to, to share their uh, vision and projects with us today. Dear Ilaria, that's your turn. <laughs> thank you very much, Aska, and thank you also to Thanks for nothing and to Asia now for this invitation. So I am also very, very glad to have Mary and Yang with us today. And as you said, Aska, when I was involved to I when I was inv invited to develop this program, I immediately thought um, of both of them uh, because of your really critical understanding in your practice, the practice you've been cultivating over the years around the four pivotal points that we will be able to address during this talk, which um, some ask already mentioned. So the question of social practices in relation to artistic research and also their presence and development in the so-called um, Asian continent, and we'll get to it in a moment, but also their relation and presence in nonprofit work and curatorial work, and also their role in trans-regional collaborations, which is something that is very important and that you both have cultivated extensively throughout your practice. So um, we will address all of these topics through the lens of your uh, respective curatorial work, your work in critical thinking, and also in institutional building. And um, I'm very excited because I keep saying, and I really believe that your practices have many elements in common. They share many elements in common, both in terms of professional methodology, but also, and I am very interested in that, and both of you know that, also in terms of personal ongoing commitment. So this is a very important sort of relation that I would love for us to discuss also as we go through all the amazing projects you've been developing. So I am very excited for you to share the same space of conversation since from what I understood is never it has never happened before. So I'm glad that we're able to make this connection today. And so without further ado, I guess I would like to start. I know Aska has done some very nice introductions, but I also am always very keen on starting an, a conversation by asking the invited speakers to introduce themselves in their own words. So Mary, perhaps would you like to go first? Sure, ah, thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks to Asia Now, thanks for nothing. This is super exciting. And um, so uh, yeah, my name is Mary Spirito and I'm the executive director and founder and curator of Proto Cinema, which just turned 10 years old this year. And we're um, an ambulant, uh, let's say cross-cultural art organization. And our core of our organization is to commission artists to make site aware installations in both New York, Istanbul and other places. We do uh, have an emerging curator series where once a year we invite a curator to make a show with us. It's a mentorship program. Uh, we have an, a screening to, annual screening tour, which goes to multiple venues around the world during the year. And um, we started a zine where we're now we're publishing texts. And so we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Maybe that's enough for now. Thank you so much, Yang. Hi, everyone. 
resonating with all the words of thanks, but I also want to add thank you to all contributing factors, um, some visible, some invisible. I'm, uh, it's nighttime, almost 10 p.m. here, where I am, um, in the northeastern part of Hong Kong, very close to the sea, very close to nature. I founded Sound Pocket in 2008, but um, now it's a team of uh, all girls, Vanessa, Mandy, and Claire. And um, we were just exchanging emails about our fundraiser, which I won't tell you about, but it's coming soon, <laughs> around Christmas. So we constantly have to think about money, but um, money is everywhere, but it's not everything. Thank you so much. So then, um, since Yang, also you mentioned where you are located at the moment, which I think is very interesting, but an important starting uh, point somewhat for, for the talk was also, or something that we really wanted to, in, to include in what we will be discussing today, is um, to start with a critical reflection of the very notion of Asia, since sort of the framework of this talk is this fair dedicated to, to Asia. So we wanted to invite voices that somewhat bring forward a critical perspective on such idea, both in terms of geographical mapping, if we wanna use that word, but also in terms of the somewhat highly multifaceted social, political, cultural identities and communities that this term embraces. Again, Mary is at one sort of, uh, in one point of the spectrum and Yang, you're in a very different point of that spectrum. So um, I would like to start by asking you, perhaps even as a provocation, um, about your uh, very own understanding and also possible definitions, which might change, I, of course, over time and throughout your work and your path, um, possible definitions of Asia um, from the perspective of your work and also from the perspective of your specific uh, locales. Yang, you wanna take this one first? Okay, <laughs> since I'm in Plover Cove, <laughs> the district I'm in, the locales is called Plover Cove. I mean, Okay, it's a challenging question. Let me start from a small point. Um, the recent uh, curation, the co-curation uh, I did, uh, the Listening Biennale, um, um, we were, I mean, I was connecting with uh, an artist space in Bangkok in Thailand. And I was telling her in this public dialogue that, oh, I've never before felt so Asian now. And this precisely came from the movement, the political movement, pro-democracy movement in 2019. And the reason why I had that thought was there was a Reuters journalist who was a friend and we were chatting and she, she was um, reporting on the movement. And she said, you know, the Hong Kong police, like they, at least at the time, were not using real bullets. But if you are in other parts of like Southeast Asia, um, they wouldn't wait <laughs> to be firing real bullets. But that was a specific time frame. Things change very fast. But that sort of comment from this friend I have, also a journalist, made me reflect on, indeed, I felt closer, maybe for the wrong reason, to my uh, neighbors. And I realized also my ignorance of what's happening uh, in different parts of um, where people live, not just the countries, but really locales. So it made me more curious, but it made me feel not alone. So that's a small point. I mean, like an acupuncture point. <clears throat> I question the idea of Asia though, because to me, um, it's better that it's, it remains an unresolved question, that we keep questioning the apparent unity of Asia and the apparent sort of economic um, alliance or pact that it, it presents itself in. Um, there are all sorts of um, critiques to be launched about it. I'm no expert at all, but I'm just um, in general against um, reductionist or overly simplistic ways of talking about anything. And then the, 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 the larger point, I guess I want to make is that I have been recently writing about um, an artist practice, an artist based in Hong Kong, and I have um, come across this book um, by Caroline Turner and Jen Webb. It's called Art and Human Rights, Contemporary Asian Contexts. 
published in 2016. And there, in very beginning chapter, they mention how the concept of Asia was developed outside of Asia, notably by the ancient Greeks. <clears throat> so it's nice to know there is an ancient sort of um, origin, but, uh, and it's also nice to know that um, cultures um, crossed um, um, way earlier than we can imagine or we would like to imagine. I don't know how anyone would like to put it, but to me, again, coming back to the first point, I, I feel that for me, it's more exciting that what Asia is, is still to be found out and that I, I really appreciate this space and time um, for us to be talking about it. Your turn, Marie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and of course, yeah, we all want to avoid generalizations, but I think there is something about when these terms get moved around Latin America, Asia, so forth, that it only really works the further away you get from that place. Like there's a relational, I think, between the space, like when you're in, like maybe you say the United States and you talk about Asia, it has a certain like use, but if you're in uh, Istanbul, or even if you're yeah, in, in Taiwan and you say Asia, that when you, the closer you get, the more you need to be more precise. And um, it changes how the generalization is then you know, utilized. So um, here, of course, people every day say, I'm going to the Asian side. You want to meet me on the European side? You know, when are you going to? It's go, we go back and forth all the time, but we don't think of, uh, we don't think of, so much of it really being connected to something so much bigger. It's just about how it's, it is in our immediate surroundings. So we say it a lot, but we don't, it doesn't feel like it's really touching on, on um, something else. But then when you have a situation, a cultural misunderstanding and someone says, but this is the way that it is in the East, Mary, you must understand. It's like, well, which part of the East? What, you know, what, we have to get specific. So I think that that's part of the dynamics of cross-cultural work that we want to bridge understanding, but only the way to get there is through like, you know, lots of tiers of misunderstanding. So I think this term Asia serves that purpose quite well. Thank you to both of you. And so, as I mentioned before, um, I believe you both have very, very in, uh, insightful understandings of social practices and also their relation to contemporary art. and. It is highly reflected um, in the work and institutions you have developed. And so I would like to ask you both about your respective organizations, Mary, as you mentioned before, 10 years ago. So congratulations. You founded Proto Cinema in Istanbul, but with this very international approach in Yang, um, you created Sound Pocket in Hong Kong in 2008. So uh, what I find interesting is that you both felt the need to develop your own organizations and also over time you have developed approaches that are in close dialogue with social political issues and also with socially engaged artistic practices so this is one element the other very interesting overlap it's from my perspective is that you created two organizations that are centered or at least in their initial intention uh, were centered and of course things expand and change over time but they were centered on mediums that can be seen somewhat as off-center. And again, this is a provocation again, if you want. Off-center compared to the field of contemporary art, right? For you, Mary, cinema, and for Yang, sound. So what I want to ask you is if you could tell us more about, first, the urgencies, the reasons that led to the creation of Proto Cinema and Sound Pocket, and also why you decided to start somewhat these organizations through the lens of a specific medium, but also how you've been working through this specific elements with socially engaged practices through your respective organizations. So if you can tell us a little bit about the origin and the thinking through this medium-based approach, and now it has evolved over time, unfolded over time, in relation also to certain socially engaged practices or in any case, social urgencies around you. And maybe, I don't know who wants to go first. Do you want me to start this one? Okay, we'll go back and forth like a ski lift. My turn, your turn. Um, so, all right, so this is really interesting because 
Um, as you also know, Proto Cinema is an art organization, a nonprofit art organization, and the, the name Proto Cinema is a little bit of a plot twist where we do show lots of moving image work, lots of film and video because moving images of vernacular of our time and we love it. But also um, the, it's the medium, if we're gonna say we're medium centric, the medium is cognition. And in the same way related to film where, um, you know, Lemur brothers, like the, tr the train in the film is coming towards and that moment in someone's brain when they jump out of their chair to get away from the, the moving train, like this is, that's the medium. And so when I was uh, starting Proto Cinema and I wanted a name that embodied this motion of moving around and being in different places, but I wanted to be really embedded in it. Um, I saw Werner Herzog's uh, film, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams about the you know 30,000 year old cave paintings in France. And um, he asks, uh, why are there beasts the cavemen drew with eight legs instead of four legs? And then he goes on to answer his own question saying that, that's man's attempt to represent motion. Maybe this is man's first attempt um, to make for, for proto cinema. So I thought that the way that an idea comes out of your head gets represented and, and then it goes into someone else's head and this transference of ideas is fascinating. And also on a personal uh, issue, which we talked about Ilaria in another talk, um, you know, how we come to understandings, how it relates to our, uh, our actions and our our environment, our context, and what those outcomes are. Uh, I would even go as far as to say like thought reform, behavior modification, and you know, belief systems, how we come to those and what that affects. That's also maybe one of the main driving forces. And so all these things like lead together to have it be um, a little bit of a trick name, but that meant that it opened up the doors for lots of other things. And now we're doing, you know, proto zine and proto this and proto that. So like, you know. Um, it's a good question. I, um, yeah, I think that's maybe enough on, on that on my end. I may have questions for you later, Marie, it's intriguing. The representation of movement. I was gonna say in relation to Asia that, okay, it's a geographical and territorial concept, but I, I mean, what about the sea? Okay, we have sort of lines drawn by people to separate the seas, but they they resist. They don't even have to resist. They are the way they are. And so um, we can't really talk about the sea in those terms. And I see actually quite um, a lot of artists in this region geographically working a lot on um, um, not even crossing the sea, but uh, linking up the shores. So I think that in, that's inspiring. But okay, in response to Yalia's question, um, there are maybe two ways in, like in terms of Hong Kong first, when I was, uh, when I founded Sound Pocket in 2008, we didn't have M plus, we didn't have um, the large institutions that most Western developed countries do. We do have Museum of Art, but a lot of us in the community question whether it is an art museum for contemporary art. So for decades, the Hong Kong scene had been driven by uh, artists and nonprofit groups, mostly artists driven. So the vibrancy actually came from artistic practices. Uh, without curators, artists would be curators. So there are many you know, hats that artists wear. So that's sort of the general environment. Things again have been changing and they will change very soon, as we all know. The institutions are coming uh, quickly and some might say aggressively, but others might say in a very good way because we have been needing those for a very long time. So there have been still debates about it. And, and then I think because of that, um, there is solidarity more and more within the art community that people feel that there, as Aska said in the introduction, uh, we believe that art is powerful, then artists can do things um, that other people cannot do. So that's a general Hong Kong environment. For sound, I guess we approach, um, like when I founded Sound Pocket, it's not so much sound as a medium, but more listening as a human activity, a capacity that we all have. I, even those who have uh, you know, challenged in their hearing, 
um, there would be other modes of listening through our bodies, uh, our skin, our bones. So listening isn't just localized uh, in the ears. So I was concerned about two things, the public culture of listening. It's, it was getting narrower and narrower, like radio, okay, pop songs and financial news and all the same, getting monolithic. And in the art world, um, I see artists uh, dealing with sound as a medium in video and maybe other practices, insulation and all that, but there is a lack of interpretation, uh, which it's maybe a more basic question about whether we have the vocabulary or the language to talk about listening and sound. So I um, encounter the, uh, not a lot because there are not a lot of artists who, who trust sound as a medium or who are curious about listening, but quite a few who are very committed uh, and curious um, in this new area. And so um, founding an organization to, to, to um, deal with something that is so uncertain it's um, a bit crazy, but um, that's also the fun part, I guess, not really knowing what we were actually doing. But now we do. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I have so far. <laughs> Can I ask about this shift that there's talk about a shift from Hong Kong to Seoul? Is that something that you feel on the ground in Hong Kong? Is that really? happening or is it just people are saying it because of the fair in Seoul right now? The ship or the ship? ship. Uh, like that the center, Hong Kong's not a center anymore, that, it, that Seoul is kind of becoming the new center because of the politics in Hong Kong. Is that really happening or is it just because people are saying it because the fair is going on right now? I don't know <laughs> about the fair. I, I, I you know, it, if I were to describe the Hong Kong art scene as I did just now, there had been no center. It's all sort of dissipated and distributed and everyone just picks something up. It's, it's very much like a pop-up that people celebrate, um, but they're, they are pop-ups in a very meaningful way. Like they, they, they need to pop up like, like sprouts in nature, like flowers that do bloom. And, but I mean, can we, as you said, Marie, can we not take turns, turns to be centers? And do centers have to be big anyway? And do they have to claim the universal anyway, right? We could all be centers anytime when we're ready when it, we're ready it comes that's beautiful yeah maybe the centers have to also be mobile we don't they don't need to be permanent centers they can be sh the shift shifting centers sorry alari we went off track what, no no i'm very happy and actually wanted to ask yang whether because you mentioned you had a question for mary but i wasn't sure whether you asked Mary, your question. So this might have been a good moment, Yang, if you want to just interject. But then we will move on to the next question that I have for you. But for now, I think it's good to address what springs up as it comes up. Sure, thank you. It's about movement. Because when you mentioned uh, Herzog, um, I'm just thinking, because I teach also at the university, and there are um, um, those of us who were um, trained in the humanities, and we have a, a lot of colleagues who are trained in modern sciences, and we're trying to forge conversations, and it's, it's a mess. <laughs> it's exciting, adventurous, but it's also like a lot of work. So I'm just thinking in terms of how artists have been representing motion, and it's an, an exciting idea for me because as a writer, like when I go into an exhibition or trying to talk about an artist's practice, I always think of how they move or how they see things move literally and also metaphorically. So I don't know much about cinema and moving images, but I'm just wondering in your experience, Marie, um, um, can you share more with us how you sort of curate, maybe should I put it this way, curate movement or curate artists? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question because it's not so much that the work is about movement, but it's about that the organization is moving. And, but, but I did see a video recently about, I mean, we all know that movement itself is a kind of uh, really important aspect of our physical existence. And when it's contained, like being in prison, incarcerated, like it really um, damages your well being, and that not being able to move, like we, ha we have a right to be rooted and in a place and we have a right to have freedom of movement. Like both these things are, are equally essential. So I think that in that there's there's something. 
And, um, and for me, the whole thing about site aware was that you're aware, you're aware of context, but the work could go somewhere else. It's not like site specific where it could only exist in this one neighborhood or mountain or something. It can go somewhere else, but then it will change when it goes somewhere else. And so if you think about social practices, it's the, it's the intersection of the context and then the action in the context. And it, that's what, that's what uh, it looks like you are doing it anyway. And if you're engaging in the context, which is the people in it, then you're gonna have this kind of thing going on. Um, I, I have a little tiny anecdote of something that just came up recently where I have a, a smart young person working for us who's you know, against urban uh, you know, gentrification, uh, eco you know, issues and so forth. Um, and there is a practice in Turkey where um, large companies and will have the employees pay for things out of their pocket and then at the end of the month, they pay them back. And I said, I, I refuse this. You come to me, we discuss how much things are, I'll give you the cash, and then you bring me the receipts. And she re resisted to the point where I had to ask her multiple times, and then she got upset that it's not the way it's done here. We've always done it this way. And I was like, but it's exploitation, and it's also a mess of my financial books. But it was interesting that we just keep doing things the way we normally do them. And something that seems so simple, it's actually like a, a labor issue. Why should any when put out money in it and get paid back for it, like on the, on the behalf of an, a company, it doesn't make sense. But she was fighting to be oppressed, even though her, a lot of her other activity is about, you know, fighting against things that are oppressing. So I don't know, I think this is small things. And the, again, the how we do it uh, is just as important as what we're doing thing. Thank you so much. So you mentioned some important things in your last answer. You mentioned freedom, freedom of movement. And the question before moving on to talk also about your other projects, um, one thing that I wanted to flag, which has emerged somewhat in a lateral way already, is that both of you work with, or with more than in, I, I must say, um, polit political surroundings, political locales that are characterized by specific tensions. and. I would say that this is true now more than ever. Yang, of course, you mentioned this already in the context of Hong Kong, right? Which has been subject to ever-growing repressive politics in its relationship with China, but also Mary in the context of Turkey, which is not uh, an, easy, an easy context, I would say, right? With a figure that has been at the top of the national political power for almost 20 years, and it's a very pro problematic figure. So because we've been talking about, as Mary's saying also, how one does things is more important, as important, more important than what one does. And so the content is important, but the processes are important. And we've been talking about socially engaged practices, but it's important to also understand where you're developing these kind of practices. So in light of all of this, I wanted to ask you how you navigate such contexts through your work, through your respective organizations, and what does it mean to nourish socially engaged practices socially engaged, even attitudes, as Mary was describing before, right? Just a way of doing things, not just projects per se, but socially engaged practices in these political contexts. How do you navigate the surrounding elements around you? It's my turn, right, <laughs> to be the center. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. I've been thinking a lot about how, um, I may be responding in a different way from, you know, like three months ago when I was speaking in public. And then I realized, not really, there's not much difference. So a short answer to that question would be, we just keep doing what we believe in. So there, actually, no change. <laughs> actually, we just keep, and, and what have we been doing? We have been supporting artists. That is our main business. Our main business is not to do exhibitions or not to do productions, but to support artists, their aspirations and their needs. And so we have been building learning communities, not just producing events. We do produce events, but that's sort of secondary. If it comes from the needs of artists, we support them doing that. But uh, we built learning communities. So one of the main programs we have had uh, is what we call the artist support program. It's very direct and explicit. So it's a 10 month sort of um, um, 
support program where we give artists a stipend. We get this money from the Arts Development Council. So it's public money, taxpayers money. So they get a stipend every month and then they get one uh, month of overseas residency, which is the point that Maria was making. We are very much into artist mobility as well, um, in and out. So this is a very challenging time to keep that going. And we are trying to negotiate that specifically because um, recently we were told that we, our funding is cut on that part. So we, are, which is why I mentioned money in the beginning, it's all everywhere. We always have to think about it, but um, it's not everything. So that's one sort of response to that. And the other, I guess, is our attention is focused mostly on the quality of our relations. So I really like Aska's term, like social commitments, like to be caring for others is really a commitment. It's not about, look, I, I know this is a principle of caring, but it's not enough to know, it's important to just actualize it. So I guess for us, by quality of relations, I mean, I think, I mean, we think of artist life as communal, that maybe some of them don't, like to socialize, they want to hide in the studio and they're a bit nerdy. But then they are also very aware, a lot of them, of what's happening around the world and how the world is affecting them and how they might or might not want to represent that in their practices or their works. And so uh, if we look just at what they display um, in public as a sort of complete work, we miss a lot. Um, so in order not to waste that big part of their lives, I guess we try to sort of foreground those in a way that they're comfortable with. So by that, I mean, for instance, if we curate like a um, festival that we did, we did five editions of uh, a listening festival, we will build um, a small young artist community around an artist we have commissioned to the festival who is more established. And then they would connect as a little learning community. And the younger artists will be taking the maybe overseas artists to unlikely places in Hong Kong to eat strange stuff and to know trees that are grown locally and to watch sunrise and you know things like that, things that you won't see in an art gallery. So it's really about um, small things, as Marie said, parochial even, but I think we might want to rescue the term parochialism from that which is too negative. Let's bring it back. Let's totally bring back that term and give it a good spin. <laughs> um, I think also to kind of continue what you were saying that um, there is always a line that's moving and we just stay aware and just stay on the other side of the line to do can do. And let's be frank, the situation is, yeah, severe in uh, Turkey, but also the United States, things are very upset and um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts over there and things are, there's a lot of, yeah. Um, so I would say that even after Gezi Park, uh, the things didn't get better, they got worse. And so I'm, um, you know, I have my concerns about the United States, how to support that while it's super important that we have these uh, chances to speak out as groups, but it's also how do we kind of get ready for it, what, what follows because it's not always better than it was before. Um, but that said, then another reason that's good to be small is that we're nimble and we can move between the raindrops and we can do what we can do. So. You know, obviously during the pandemic, we were able to do little interventions in existing spaces that were open during this, and like big institutions couldn't do that. Or because we have our, our, our audience, we can maybe show work that might be a little bit more, if it was shown in a big museum, they would not be able to do it, but we were able to do it. So I think, you know, just always keeping up with the, the moving uh, tide is uh, how we survive, so. Can I quickly add to that? I love that idea <laughs> that, we, we describe ourselves as a microbe. So I think microbes um, work really well, like digesting things and upcycling things and in a quiet sort of way, in secrecy. <laughs> so, I mean, but to put it in a more formal, serious language and also to you respond to Yaria's uh, question in the beginning, I, we, we are seeing a, a 
you know, deliberate and pretty aggressive policy of atomization in our society. So it's everywhere in the news that um, civil organizations that have been running for decades have to disband. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm, I do not think our civil society is gone. I think it's richer than ever because it's in the micro being level. That's a perfect metaphor. I love it. It's great. Thank you to both of you. And so I'm very glad to hear all, all of this because it reinforces my thoughts about how somewhat there's a strong overlap between your respective practices. And so continuing on that parallelism somewhat, um, I wanted to also talk about your cross-regional work uh, because you've been working very much in this direction. You've mentioned this already. And I wanted to ask you more specifically about two recent projects that you have developed, which I mean, projects that you've been developing for some time, but then there's two recent iterations of them that I would love to ask you about. Um, so in the case of Merriam Proto Cinema, there's a project titled A Few in Many Places, and you've recently had a series of projects as part of this bigger umbrella. And for Yang, uh, you mentioned it briefly before, is the 2021 listening biennial. So I would just ask you if you could guide us through these projects, discuss their multi-site and also their collaborative approach. I guess it's Mary's turn, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So um, thanks. I love to talk about this project. A uh, Few in Many Places was born in 2020 and then in five cities and we did it again in 2021 six cities and the impulse initially was that there was this huge you know a retreat online or a huge rush to be a present online and while we love the being globally interconnected and find it extremely important we also wanted to stay a little bit in real life keep a foot in you know our local communities and to keep it engaging even if it was only three or four people at a time you know um because we do value the person-to-person -person aspects enormously. So that was what we did. We invited artists to do interventions in somewhere in their local community and uh, gave them funding for a fee, for the materials, low materials for the commission and uh, to have somebody next to them, get okay, a friend or a colleague or a writer or a curator, somebody it doesn't have to be official. Like, and we, we did this and we interconnected them through Protozine with texts from different places writing from far away about these scenes and it was really nice. And then we did it again in 2021 and we invited Abhijan Toto, who's a really dynamic, interesting thinker um, to uh, co-curate it with us, which was great because then also he brought in a lot of his relationships in Southeast Asia um, and Korea was a very nice one is from Seoul. And so that was really dynamic because then all of a sudden we had more people and that was more collaborations. This one was actually about um, how do we break cycles of violence and working collectively as a kind of counterbalance. Um, but it was like, um, it, got, it got much bigger, much faster. And uh, so you have like a collective, like welcome to Ogasawara in Seoul. And there's like eight people in this collective. And so we can't talk to everybody, but they did an amazing innovative project, which was actually about the, um, the fact that the internet is not um, open and free to all. It has just as many boundaries as the physical real world. And they use the sea and pirating as metaphors because we also know the sea does have boundaries. And um, so they made physical QR codes that went into a shopping mall and you had to physically go there to use your phone to get in it. You couldn't get the QR codes any other way. But then once you went there at different times of day and at different spots in the mall, you would get access to different online artworks, which is pretty incredible. And then we also put those QR codes, of course, in other cities uh, to make it available to more, more audience. Um, and uh, the idea too is um, a longing for plurality to have multiple different kinds of voices and different perspectives. And what happened was the process of working on it, of course, 
when you're talking to the different people, this one was Seoul, Bangkok, Istanbul, New York, Puerto Rico, and Guatemala City. All the situations are, are very different from each other. But then every week or two weeks, they're also changing within themselves. There's you know, different political crises, different weather crises, different COVID crises. So we're always moving things around. And any attempt to standardize was just like dissolved and it was not possible. For example, we had like, let's open on this date. Well, we can't open because of you know, all these different reasons. So we had things that were kind of opening and closing at different times. And so I love this idea that it's not an exhibition that's contained by time with a beginning date and an end date. Um, and for example, Michelle Lopez did an audio uh, piece in Philadelphia in the 2021 version. And we had that out on the streets with um, kids on bikes um, called Catch Me, Catch Me If You Can't, Catch Me in Traffic. Um, and these kids are like, you know, doing wheelies in the streets and playing her audio piece. And, uh, but she really wanted to do it around the Liberty Bell, but because of the inauguration, uh, because of the Black Lives Matter, because of all these other things that were going on, we did it again and we didn't do it until and finally in 2021. So these kings have these longer, longer spans. Um, and maybe that's enough for now, um, but it was really a longing for, we wanna get more deep in our own community, but we also really wanted to not get into these silos of you know, um, blocked travel and all these other, and being stuck only online to figure out a way to stay connected. And I think that is something that we could expand on more and maybe need to expand on more. I just, um, Marie, I just have a, cause I, 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 I read a, lot, a, bit, a bit about this project and I was wondering, the, um, do you know why it's called Welcome to Ogasawara? Cause like Ogasawara is the name of that like paradise kind of island which is like you have to take a boat to go there and I was wondering if um I was wondering if if you you knew the reason why it was called this way or well I know that the um the, that collective uses a lot of the pirate narratives and they love that it's like a perfect looking pirate but there I'm sure there's other complex um layers underneath it so we should talk to Miji Lee and get her in here one day yes we, we should we will I love that <laughs> I'm thinking of a, a pirate legend that we have in one of the islands of Hong Kong, but I shouldn't go there because I don't know enough. Um, I want to resonate with what Marie said about, uh, you know, the rhythm and the, the dynamic of, you know, things opening and closing at different times. I guess the the, the Visioning Biennale that I co-curated with um, Brandon, Israel and Buddha, uh, we are in different time zones and we have had only, what, three Zoom meetings? I've never met Buddha in Israel, uh, except on Zoom. Brandon I knew from before because he came to Hong Kong on um, some other occasions. But I guess, I mean, the programs, uh, anyone could just go to the website and there are archives and there is still an artist list. So um, you can get a sense of what happened. But from my more personal um, sort of experience, I guess, as co-curator, first of all, I feel really lucky to have been involved and that we have already committed the four of us um, in terms of you know the next edition and how to structure this uh, in a more permanent way. So this first edition, I guess, is really about experimenting, uh, but based on a lot of trust. I mean, it's amazing to me that, not that we know each other personally so much, but that maybe we know each other's work somehow. And through Brendan's initiation, bringing us together, that gesture of you know, gathering uh, rather than contributing factors, um, that's a beautiful gesture that he first initiated. And I think at this time, during the pandemic and that um, Mary also mentioned about how you know, important mobility is and sometimes we're constrained, coerced into to it. And so this, um, it, but, but then to resolve it, it takes maybe just a tiny step forward from all of us that if we would care to just make this small gesture of inviting someone, then everything could become different. This is a very sort of big imprint that had um, come to me because of the listening Biennale. And besides trust and experiment, I think it's also, it, um, 
for me, what we organize, okay, to be more concrete, like in Hong Kong, for instance, I curated a number of um, listening situations I call. It's in my piece of writing in the, on the website. And, um, and by that, I mean, um, we don't actually know what might happen. Anything can happen. Um, there would be performance artists, there are dialogues uh, with artists. And so we keep it spontaneous, just as Iaria has curated this conversation. And one specific example I want to mention is uh, Wantani Siri, the Bangkok-based artist. We talked about whether she wanted to show her work in Berlin, which is one site for the Biennale, but there are multiple sites really in Hong Kong, in multiple cities in Mexico, and also other parts of Europe, and in Taiwan, also in Taipei. Um, so when I was asking Wantani, would you like your video work to be shown in Berlin in the gallery? And she said, you know, it would be nice, but the point of showing my work is that I would be present and then making connections with other human beings. And so it's no, there's no point if I just send my video work, you know, as data <laughs> and that, you know, it will be professionally sort of taken care of. So we decided then because of the pandemic situation that we will actually come into a conversation. So the conversation took place in Hong Kong. It's an artist studio turned uh, artist hub. It's called 1983. So again, you can find it on the website. And uh, it's very vibrant and has organized hundreds of events already. And that night we talked for like five hours and there were maybe 10 of us in the group and with Wantani in Bangkok and us in Hong Kong. Uh, we, we shared things about dem democratic politics and she showed videos she took on the streets about, you know, police um, uh, standoffs uh, with the people. And so um, I guess that's what we needed the most then and maybe now uh, and forever as well, <laughs> just to be with each other and making space for each other. And this is what I mean by, I guess, Sam Popis principle as well, that, um, you know, there is this very strong, uh, I guess, school of thought <laughs> um, portraying the artist as the loner and, you know, um, individualist, um, uh, even solitary figure. I guess there is that in all of us, but then there is also this longing to connect in different ways. So I guess we, we, we fill in that little gap with a, a micro sort of body. Sorry, it's a little bit far-fetched. Thank you. I would say not at all. And it's why I was so excited to have both of you, as I was saying, because you're so interested in the political as you are in the relational and in the personal somewhat. And I think that is the level of investment that really brings forward serious and real political work. Um, and so we're, I think, almost at the end of our time together, but uh, I wanted to ask you, of course, what you're working on right now and, um, and also what kind of future you see for your respective organizations, how you're imagining the future of your respective organizations. And also since we've been talking so much about social engaged practices, also your opinion in regard to how they are transforming, you've touched upon this uh, briefly before, but how they are transforming and how they're doing so also in the, in the Asian context and beyond and somewhat what are uh, some of these new urgencies uh, that you are seeing emerging from the context and also how they can be addressed through uh, your work, but also beyond, I guess, um, your um, respective organizations. <laughs> Is it my turn? <laughs> so, yeah, it's your turn again. Okay, okay. and then change. Um, there, uh, and this is a really, I think, important question for us. Um, one, artist mobility, I mentioned already, so that's one of the urgencies with immediate, I mean, working on it on an everyday basis. The second one is translation. So, I mean, translation as in between languages, but also as in um, um, trying to communicate with each other in a way that is parochial, that we translate the details. And that's really important because art, um, from reflecting on what happened in the past few years, um, is coming out strong and shining. 
and more and more. And I'm, I'm very moved by how artists are committed to um, keep sort of speaking out and doing what they can do. And so the job for, I guess, people like me, who knows nothing but to write, um, is to articulate what they are doing. And it's not so easy because it takes language translation and all cross-cultural translation that Marie mentioned. And which, which takes me to this other thing that I'd like to maybe quote from, um, because I've been writing again about an art, artist's practice, which is um, quite political in the sense of his uh, sort of disidentification with the figure of the nation. So this is Alex Danshev. Um, it, he's written a piece called Witnessing and is collected in a book called um, The Global, um, sorry, Visual Global Politics. I'm sorry, I might, I might have missaid uh, it, but it's um, edited by uh, Bleicher. But I just want to say that in Danshev's uh, piece on witnessing, uh, I found it very moving that he talks of artists as uh, moral witnesses so I want to read a few lines from Dan Chef, um, uh, witnessing. So quoting, actually, uh, Afishai Margalit. Uh, witnessing may not change the world, but having that conversation marks it, tempers it, and sometimes rubs it red raw. This is Dan Chef's work, words. The act of witnessing is not a neutral act. It does not leave things as the witness finds them. It does not spare feelings. The witness spares nothing and nobody, not even the witness. That is the idea, to prick the conscience, to lodge in the memory or stick in the throat. In this sense, the witness is more akin to an agitator than a bystander, but also more purposive, more principled, more pure. If the bystander is a deeply compromised figure, the witness is a profoundly elevated one. Put differently, the witness is a historical agent with a moral purpose and a militant faith. In Afishai Marguerite's words, I'm quoting her uh, Afishai, that in another place or another time there exists or will exist a moral community that will listen to their testimony, unquote. I, I cannot say that myself or Sound Pocket could rise up to that point, but I see a lot around us who have already done that, and I aspire to that, and I have you as our witness. Thank you. Thank you. I um, I know that you're a writer and I've seen you speak before and read beautiful things. So I gave it some thought and I thought I should also read something. <laughs> um, this super classic Krishna Murthy from Freedom of the Known Freedom from the known, sorry. And it kind of relates to kind of where we're in this uh, turbulent time right now. Um, and so beginning quote, you may say, I can't do anything about it. Or how can I influence the world? I think you can tremendously influence the world if you yourself are not violent. If you lead actually every day a peaceful life, a life which is not competitive, ambitious, envious, a life which does not create amenity, small fires can become a blaze. I have that book, Marie, and more from Krishnamurti. We should run a reading group together one day. Why not? I would That's love that because yeah. I'm really thinking a lot about like 
you know, Zoom, I think, is good one on one, but group Zooms are a disaster. And, you know, when you do these long distance collaborations, you're only talking to the artists and the curator that and the, the communities don't get to talk to the communities. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to torque this whole thing somehow and like just each senders forward to more engagement because I am, I think the urgency is this siloification and these, this not moving because even if we can get visas and all this stuff, like I don't want to fly the way we used to fly. So I say yes. I will be the first to sign up. You know that, right? Um, I have no words to thank you, both of you, for what is always your incredible generosity, humanity, empathy. These are all incredibly precious things. So thank you for putting them out there in public in a way. I am very grateful to both of you for the wonderful, wonderful professional also example that you set for people who are working in this field. So I really hope that this conversation will go long and far into the world uh, to really, uh, really, really show how this work can be done, right? With this approach of um, owing and not owning. No, this is not me. This is a wonderful scholar, Rolando Vasquez, but it's really, really what I see in your work and in you every time I have the privilege to chat with you and to, to check in with you and to speak with you. So thank you very much. And I don't think we can end on a better note or a higher note or any other kind of note. This is it as far as I'm concerned. So thank you so very much again. Um, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful moving move moment. Also, I was very, um, I, fe I feel very grateful to have witnessed it, uh, especially uh, to be the first to witness it because uh, this is a pre-recorded conversation. So um, yeah, thank you so much. I had I had so many topic things that I wanted to talk to you about, but as Ilaria was saying, I think um, we should reflect on what just happened. Um, and uh, I just, uh, I was very um, moved by your readings and, and let's just end this conversation by saying that we can all be centers when we're ready as Young was saying. Um, and uh, yeah, and just keep, uh, as, as you were saying also, those some kinds of um, notions or concepts as when you were talking about Asia, you were saying that um, some, it's good that they remain unresolved also, but that it's important to just um, keep that space and time where we discuss it. And I think that's something that we managed to do, that you managed to do uh, very be beautifully, uh, today. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much for um, those uh, amazing moments and, and can't wait for the, uh, if, if I can be part of the reading uh, group as well, please just send me an invite. <laughs> and um, thank you. Thank you so much for to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>